Hi there everyone, I have been really looking forward to making this video. Last week I had the opportunity to test a brand new prototype ESC from FETTECH that uses a new method of driving our motors never before seen in FPV. And I thought it gives us a perfect opportunity to do a deep dive on how our ESCs drive our motors and how this new FETTECH SFOC ESC takes everything to the next level. It's a lot to cover in one video, this is going to be a technical deep dive, let's get into it. All right, before we dive into the depths of ESC commutation, I think it's important to first recap the motor connections to each of our brushless DC motors. Although every BLDC motor has several coils, schematically they can all be drawn as three phases, A, B, and C, drawn here in purple, green, and orange. Each phase is then wrapped around three or four coils inside the motor, depending on whether it's a nine pole motor, in which case each phase goes around three coils, or a 12 pole motor, in which case each phase is going to go around four coils. The ESC is then connected to the motor at, along the three motor wires, X, Y, and Z, and you can see that each of the terminals, X, Y, and Z, is connected to two of the phases, and it makes this sort of triangular diagram. When we spin a brushless DC motor, it acts as a generator, and it produces a back EMF current on the phases. Because of the symmetry between the motor being spun and driving the motor to spin, the back EMF current actually indicates the ideal shape of the driving current for that particular motor. So this uh, graph was taken by Felix at Vettec, and this is for a T-Motor F40 Pro, and you can see that the back EMF current on each of the phases looks very, very close to a sinusoid, nearly a perfect sinusoid. And that means that the ideal driving current for this motor is also nearly perfectly sinusoidal. And if we drive it with that ideal current, we'll get the most performance, the most torque and power, and we'll also get the best possible efficiency from the motor. There are several different ways that we can drive a motor, but the simplest method is called block commutation. In block commutation, we simply drive the phase of the motor whenever the ideal driving current is more than 50%. So here in the black line, we have the ideal driving current given by the back EMF of the motor. And we simply say, well, whenever that driving current is greater than 50%, I'll drive the phase. And whenever that ideal driving current is less than 50%, I won't drive the phase. And similarly, when it's in the reverse direction, I'll drive it in the reverse direction and now I won't drive it. And this is a really simple method. This is basically just rounding, you know, more than a half, round up to one, drive the phase, less than a half, round down to zero and don't drive the phase. Whenever the phase is not being driven, the voltage created by the back EMF current can be measured and that can be used to determine the rotor position. So the ESC looks for what's called the zero crossing. That's where the back EMF current and therefore back EMF voltage crosses zero and that indicates that the magnet is precisely opposite the coil and it basically tells the ESC where the rotor is so that it knows how to drive the rotor round and round. In reality, block commutation like this introduces some problems. Firstly, turning the phase on and off very quickly introduces spikes because you've got fields in the coils being created and destroyed very rapidly. And whenever you've got a field collapsing quickly, you get a spike in current. And you can see this on the input current to the ESC. So this is called a demagnetization spike. It's when the field in the coil is collapsing and the ESC draws more current as a result. The second problem is that 33% of the time you are not driving the phase. So you could be driving the phase a little bit and getting a bit more torque and a bit more power out of the motor, but instead you're not driving the phase and you're listening for the zero crossing on the back EMF voltage. So you're missing some time where you could be putting power into the motor and getting useful work done um, because you're listening for that zero crossing. Block commutation is also not the most efficient way to drive the motor because the drive current that you're applying is not the same shape as the back EMF current from the motor. It's not that ideal sinusoid. So you're under driving the motor at certain times when you're listening for the back EMF and you're over driving the motor at other times when you're driving the phase full before the back EMF current in the motor has reached its peak. So block commutation is by no means the perfect approach to driving a motor. 
Sinusoidal commutation is another way to drive a motor and it alleviates some of the issues with block commutation. If we're using a PWM drive, which we are for all of our FPV ESCs, then using PWM, it is possible to create sinusoidal driving voltages. So rather than just driving the phase fully on or fully off, you actually vary the drive voltage on each of those terminals X, Y, and Z in a sinusoidal way to get a sinusoidal voltage across each of the phases A, B, and C. And this is the most efficient and the smoothest way to drive a motor because it provides exactly the right shape of driving current that matches the back EMF. So we know the motor wants to accept a sinusoidal driving current and you're giving it one. However, just pure sinusoidal commutation also has some problems. The first problem with sinusoidal commutation is switching losses. When the FETs in our ESCs are switching, they momentarily dissipate a lot more power. And this is the same reason why when you overclock a PC, the CPU gets hot. It's because you're making the uh, transistors in the CPU switch faster, and so they dissipate more power. When we're doing block commutation, we don't have to worry too much about switching losses. When we are holding the phase to zero, which is for quite a lot of the time, we're not switching the FETs at all. We just have the FET between the motor phase and ground on, and it stays on. That holds the phase to zero, and we don't do any switching. When we're driving the phase to a positive voltage, if we're at full throttle, 100%, we don't do any switching either because we're just connecting battery voltage straight across that phase and we're not switching. If we're at part throttle, then we do have to switch the FETs when we're driving the phase, but we still are not switching the FETs when we're just holding the phase to ground. So with block commutation, you only get switching losses when you're driving the phase and only when you're driving the phase at less than full throttle. So you get the minimum switching losses. With sinusoidal drive, we are basically partly driving the phase all of the time. There's only an instant where we have the phase fully on and there's only an instant where we have the phase at zero. All the rest of the time, we are driving the phase somewhere between zero and 100%. And that means that we're switching the FETs. That means that we're introducing switching losses. And that's happening all the time everywhere. And that does cause the ESC to dissipate a bit more power. And it will cause the ESC to heat up a bit more than if you were doing block commutation. The second problem with sinusoidal commutation is to do with the driving voltage. With block commutation at full throttle, you are getting the full battery voltage across every phase. So let's look here at the terminal X and terminal Z. Between X and Z, we are getting full battery voltage. That means full battery voltage across phase A, and that's giving us maximum power. With sinusoidal drive, let's look at the same point. So we're looking between red and blue. You can see that there's nowhere where we get full battery voltage across that phase. At most, we get about 87% of battery voltage across the phase at the peak where the two sinusoids are as far apart as possible. This reduces the maximum torque and maximum power that we can get from a motor with sinusoidal drive compared to what we can achieve with block commutation. If you love these type of deep technical videos, you are going to adore AOS Labs. I've brought together all of my product testing results on motors, batteries, props, ESCs, and VTXs all into one place to help you find the highest performing and best value components for your next FPV build. There's links down in the video description. Why not click through and check it out? You won't find this data anywhere else. SVM commutation or space vector modulation is a really elegant way of solving a lot of the problems that we saw with pure sinusoidal commutation whilst maintaining all of its advantages. With SVM, you can see that the driving voltage spends a long time at zero volts. You see it's zero here and then this yellow phase is zero all the way along here. All the time that the phase is at zero, we're not switching. So we're saving on switching losses. And also we can see that at full throttle, each phase does receive the full driving voltage from the battery, full battery voltage, and therefore you get full torque and power. But you may be wondering, how does this weird double hump shape provide a nice sinusoidal driving current for our motor? It doesn't look anything like a sinusoid. Well, the answer is really interesting. The way SVM works is it does a subtraction on the signals on each of the phases. So we start with our pure sinusoidal voltage, 
this phase voltage here, and we subtract the SVM signal, which is this sort of weird wave shape. And this wave shape actually comes from the minimum of all of the three phases. So you can see here, if we just look at the minimum voltage of all the three phases, it starts off blue, and then the minimum is now yellow, and then the minimum is red. So we just take that minimum voltage, and that's our SVM voltage signal, which we subtract from all the phases. And that gives us our weird double hump SVM voltage signal. But what does it do to the current? Well, obviously we start off with a nice sinusoidal driving current because we've started off with a nice sinusoidal driving voltage. But then we subtract the SVM current signal. But the SVM current signal is zero because we're applying the same voltage to all the phases. So there's no voltage across the phases and therefore no current through any of the phases. So the current signal we're subtracting is zero, which means that this strange looking SVM drive voltage provides exactly the same current through each of the phases as our original sinusoidal driving voltage. So we get a beautiful sinusoidal driving current despite not having a beautiful sinusoidal driving voltage. Also, and it's a subtle thing, you'll notice that our phase voltage ranged from 100% to 0%. It covered the full range of our battery voltage. But our SVM voltage only gets up to about 85% 80, or so of full battery voltage. This means that we have extra headroom for more power. We can increase the amplitude of our driving voltage. We can push these humps up to 100% and we can get more torque and power out of the motor without having to increase the battery voltage. And that's the genius of space vector modulation. Let me show you now another graph. Again, this is from Felix at FETTEC showing you his SVM commutation in reality on an actual motor. This is again a T-Motor F40 Pro at full throttle. You can see that the SVM voltage starts at zero. Basically the phase is low. That's this red section here where it's along 0%. And then you can see that we use PWM drive to simulate that increasing sinusoidal voltage. It peaks here at full voltage for a little while. Then it comes down again. You can see it's PWMing again, so the voltage is a little bit less than full. Then it goes back up to full voltage for this hump here, and then down to zero again using that PWM drive. And then he's also kindly measured the phase current for us, and you can see that it's remarkably close to this perfectly sinusoidal phase current, and it's very, very close to the back EMF current of the motor, which makes SVM drive very, very efficient. However, there is one problem with pure sinusoidal drive that SVM cannot solve. And that is that with SVM, every phase is being driven all of the time. We always have active driving current through the phase. Let's look at phase A. It's always being driven. I mean, maybe just at an instant there's no driving current, but it's for an instant and then we're driving in the opposite direction. And this makes it impossible to listen for the back EMF zero crossing directly. You remember with block commutation, we had a period where we weren't driving the phase, and that was when we would listen for the back EMF of the motor so that we would know where the rotor is relative to the coil. Well, with SVM, we don't have that information. Instead, with SVM, you have to measure the current in each phase all the time, and you have to measure the voltage that you're applying to each phase, and then you do a calculation to work out the back EMF based on the voltage and current. This final slide highlights the big step forward that FETTEC are taking with this new SFOC ESC. Previous ESCs with sinusoidal drive, be they FETTEC, BL Heli 32 or AM32, have always had to modify this SVM driving voltage with a zero drive period to listen for the back EMF from the motor to determine the rotor position relative to the coil and make sure that the ESC is in sync with the rotation of the motor. This period of zero drive modifies the perfect sinusoidal current and it creates this slightly jagged waveform. You can see that it's a much closer approximation to a sinusoid than block commutation, so it's better than block commutation, but it's by no means a perfect sinusoid. This new SFOC ESC from FETTEC takes this a step further. It doesn't need to have this zero drive period in the waveform anymore. The SFOC ESC is measuring the current through the phase and the voltage across the phase all of the time. 
And if you know both the current and the voltage through the phase, as well as some parameters about the motor, you can calculate the back EMF. That means that the FETTEC ESC can calculate the back EMF at any point during this waveform. So unlike a previous ESC where you can only know the rotor position at three times, so you know the rotor position here, here, and here, with the SFOC ESC, it can calculate the rotor position continuously. It always knows exactly where the rotor is. So that gives you more resolution on your timing, and that means the motor will run slightly smoother. Also, you're getting a perfect sinusoidal waveform. There's no jagged bits because of zero drive time, which means that the motor is going to run smoother and more efficient. And you're also driving the motor all the time, which means you are maximizing the amount of torque and power that you can get out of the motor. So are we going to see this approach used in other ESCs? Possibly, but there are some specific hardware requirements. To measure the back EMF in this way, you have to have a shunt resistor on at least one of the phases of each motor so that you can measure the current through the phase as well as the voltage across it to calculate the back EMF. Most ESCs in FPV at the moment only have one shunt resistor for the whole ESC. It's over on the battery leads and it's used to measure the current being consumed by all four of the motors. So it wouldn't be appropriate for this type of back EMF calculation. The FETTEC SFOC ESC appears to have two shunt resistors for each of the uh, individual motors. So you can see motor one, two, three, four, and what look to be two shunt resistors next to the microcontrollers and gate drivers. So that brings us to the end of this deep dive on the different commutation methods that are used in FPV ESCs. I really enjoyed learning about all this stuff and putting together this video, and I really hope you enjoyed it as well. If you want to support more videos like this, then please check out the links down in the video description, support me directly on Patreon, or indirectly using any of the affiliate links. I would really appreciate it. That's all I have for you for today, so until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.